Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. I have a stupid question. Oh, boy. Go ahead. I keep hearing and reading about B-sides. Yeah. So, what's it? Beside? What's it next to? What? If it's beside something, what's the other thing? Are you talking about music? Yeah, and while we're at it, when they say a song is aside something, it's aside from what? Is that like a soliloquy? Are you talking about A-sides and B-sides? Isn't that what I said? You're a child of the digital age, aren't you? That's me, Binary Boy. You've never had to turn over a record? What's a record? I feel so old. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Back in the day, there were two sides to all the music you bought. Vinyl records and cassettes had two sides. Once you finished listening to one side, which usually took about 20 minutes, you had to get up and physically turn the thing over so you could hear the other side. Now wait, bear with me on this. There are people listening to this show who have never had to flip over a record or a cassette. Digital kids have only had to know one thing. The label side of the CD goes up. All right, so back to vinyl. Also back in the day, we had the seven inch single. If you're of a certain age, you'll remember how the 45 RPM record was the heart and soul of rock and roll. Untold billions of them were sold. Singles usually featured two songs. One was the big track of the moment, the top 40 hit. Instead of buying the album, you could just buy this one song. And it took up one full side of this 7-inch piece of vinyl. It was the focus. It was numero uno in terms of importance. It was the A side. But what about the other side of the record? You couldn't just leave it blank. It was expected that something had to take up this space. So the band or the record company stuck another song there. Sometimes it was one of the lesser songs in the current album. Other times it was a track that didn't make the final cut for the record. Whatever the case, it was placed on the B side. The Beatles were sometimes pretty kind. They put good songs on both sides of their singles. For example, Hey Jude came with the fast and raunchy version of Revolution on the B side, and it became a hit too. But in most cases, the second side of a single was just a throwaway. Later, when we moved from vinyl to CDs, the practice of including B-sides continued, except that they weren't really put on the B-side because, after all, there's only one playable side of a CD. Instead, one, two, or even three tracks of them were stuck in a sequence behind the lead track on a CD single. Sometimes they were called bonus tracks, but old habits die hard. Just as we don't dial a phone anymore, we still refer to these secondary tracks as B-sides. Not all people ignored B-sides. True music geeks listened to both sides of all their 7-inch singles and to all the bonus tracks on their CD singles. And occasionally, they were rewarded with a song that was as good or even better than the A-side. This show is all about those hidden gems. Hello, I'm Alan Cross, and I've collected some of the greatest and most interesting B-sides in the history of alt-rock. There were hundreds of good songs that were stuck at the back of the bus, and I've collected together nine of the best. These tracks may have entered the world as orphans, recordings designed to do nothing more than take up space, but they eventually became famous on their own. And here they are, in no particular order, beginning with this gem from 1984. The Smiths, with How Soon Is Now, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, song in their catalog. It's How Soon Is Now. Believe it or not, this song was a throwaway. The Smiths thought so little of it that it first appeared buried at the very back of a limited edition 12-inch single from August 1984. The lead track was William, It Was Really Nothing. Then came Please, Please, Please Let Me Get What I Want. And then came, right at the very back, How Soon Is Now. It was then included on an album called Hatful of Hollow, which itself was a collection of odds and ends issued by the Smiths record label in order to buy the band a little more time so they could record a proper second album. It came out in November 1984. How Soon Is Now did come out as a single in February 1985, but only because English fans were paying huge prices for a Dutch import version of the single. And later, when the Smiths signed to Sire Records in America, it was issued as a single but in a very vulgar edited version. Today, How Soon Is Now is regarded as a retro classic and one of the best recordings of the 1980s. And to think it started 
as a B-side. Let's move on to this one from Nirvana. Conventional wisdom says that Kurt Cobain wrote everything Nirvana ever recorded, and that Dave Grohl was only allowed to come into his own as a musician and songwriter when he formed the Foo Fighters. That assumption would be a little bit incorrect. Dave was a pretty decent singer and guitarist long before he joined Nirvana. He developed some decent chops in a couple of other bands, including a not-so-bad DC band called Scream. Dave was the last guy to join Nirvana, and by the time he made his way to Seattle, it was clear that this was Kurt's band. So Dave basically did what he was told, keeping time and singing backup for Kurt's songs. However, he wasn't shut out entirely. Nirvana released exactly one track that was written and sung by drummer Dave Grohl. If you've never heard it, don't feel bad because it was a B-side. The only place you'll ever find it is buried at the end of the CD single for Heart Shaped Box back in the days of the In Utero album. Want to hear it? Long before there was such a thing as a Foo Fighter, here's Dave Grohl singing an original song with Nirvana called Marigold. Six colored pictures all in a row A marigold Peace in case I want An interesting B-side from Nirvana. Drummer Dave Grohl on vocals singing a song he wrote for the band called Marigold. The early days of Nine Inch Nails were pretty awful for Trent Reznor. After the first album, Pretty Hate Machine, was released, Trent found himself in an ugly legal battle with his record label, a battle that kept him and his band and his music out of circulation for a number of years. The last thing Trent released before things went to hell was a single called Sin. If you know Trent and his records, you'll recognize this as Halo 4. It featured three different versions of a song called Sin, which appeared on Pretty Hate Machine. These recordings took up tracks 1, 2, and 4. Sandwiched in there, at track number 3, was Trent's version of an old song done by Queen back in the 1970s. Over the years, it had become something of a showstopper whenever Nine Inch Nails played it live. The track featured some rather disturbing-sounding samples. A spoken word bit by the guy is apparently from an old cable access show called Video Psychotherapy. And the woman is... Well, that's from an old Japanese porn movie from a collection owned by Al Jorgensen of Ministry. He was the guy who insisted on using them, and he helped Trent produce that part of the single. The result was a pretty cool B-side. Here's Nine Inch Nails with Get Down, Make Love. Nine Inch Nails with Get Down, Make Love. Great B-side from the Sin EP of 1990. More than a decade after they first performed and recorded the song, a lot of Pearl Jam fans are still unclear as to the name and the origin of this next B-side. Out of all the bonus tracks Pearl Jam has ever released, this remains the biggest. Heck, had they included it on an album and released it as a single, it might have been a worldwide hit. The track is Yellow Leadbetter. It first appeared on a European CD single for Jeremy in 1992. That meant that anyone in North America who wanted a copy of the track had to track down a high-priced import. A live version could be found on a Japanese CD single for Daughter. It seems that no one but the band knows what the song is all about. Eddie mumbles through most of it, so any lyric transcriptions you find on the internet, and a quick search will turn up about 5,000 pages, are just rough approximations. Yes, I know that the Japanese CD single came with a lyric sheet, but anyone who's ever heard Pearl Jam play Yellow Leadbetter live will know that Eddie often decides to improvise whenever Pearl Jam plays the song live. He rarely, if ever, follows the official lyrics. But that hasn't kept thousands of fans from spending hours analyzing the words they could make out and discussing the deeper meanings of that porch where people don't wave. Pearl Jam with their great B-side, Yellow Leadbetter. And just to add a final point to all this, there really is someone named Yellow Leadbetter, except that his first name is Tim. Tim Leadbetter. He's an old friend of Eddie's from Chicago. The whole thing is a bit of an inside joke. 
More great B-sides coming from Oasis, U2, and XTC next. This next great B-side might have gone completely unnoticed had someone made a better choice for the A-side. It was 1986, and expectations for the new XTC album were running high. After all, Skylarking had been produced by Todd Rundgren, a great pop tunesmith in his own right. What kind of magic could he help Andy Partridge weave? But it didn't work out that way. Andy and Todd butted heads from the beginning over everything, and it was anything but a happy relationship. In fact, it was an awful experience on both sides. The only thing that everyone agreed on was that this one song should, under no circumstances, be picked as the single. And there were those at the record label who agreed. They all thought that it was a terrible song, which just goes to show you that sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. Andy Partridge thought the track was trite, an arrogant attempt to sum up man's relationship with God in just three and a half minutes. The people at Virgin Records didn't like the whiny kid at the beginning, and there were those who were concerned about the subject matter. So, the song was dropped from the Skylarking album altogether. It was relegated to the role of filler, appearing only on the B-side to both the 7-inch and 12-inch of another track called Grass. When Grass came out on August 26, 1986, it was an immediate and unqualified bomb. No one cared. It was a disaster. However, a number of radio stations had flipped the record over in disgust. And they and their listeners were quite enchanted by what they heard. The reaction was huge. XTC's American record label started calling England in a panic. What's this song? Where do these stations get it from? Why don't we know anything about it? Virgin Records snapped into action. The Skylarking album was repressed and reissued with the track intact. And as a result, the record started to sell. And thanks to this one song that no one liked, XTC quickly sold a quarter million albums. XTC with Dear God from 1986, one of the great B-side stories of the decade. A postscript to that song. As you might remember, the subject matter of Dear God caused a considerable amount of weeping and gnashing of teeth. There was the expected outrage from religious groups. A Florida radio station received a bomb threat from someone, as in, play that song again and I'll blow you up. And in Birmingham, New York, Gary Pullis, an 18-year-old high school student, pulled a knife on the secretary in the principal's office one morning and demanded that Dear God be played over the PA over and over and over again. He was eventually subdued, arrested, and remanded for a psychiatric evaluation. Sometimes even rock stars fall afoul of their families. Such was the case with Bono and his wife, Allie. U2 was all wrapped up in the sessions for the Joshua Tree album in 1986, and Bono committed a major sin. He forgot his wife's birthday. Well, okay, so he didn't exactly forget. He just didn't make it home to Dublin in time for her birthday. So, to suck up, he tried to write this sweet little love song. But Bono will be the first to admit that he's not very good at writing simple love songs, and the rest of the band would agree. They were not impressed either. The result was a little, in their minds, subpar. So, rather than stick it on the Joshua Tree, the song, now called The Sweetest Thing, was relegated to the B-side of a 12-inch of Where the Streets Have No Name, one of the big singles from the Joshua Tree. And there it lay, mostly forgotten for more than a decade. The band, however, knew it was there, and they were waiting for something. Then came 1998, and U2's first Greatest Hits collection. And whenever a label issues something like this, they try and add some value, you know, a hook to get people to buy songs that they already own on different albums. And in this case, someone suggested that U2 revisit The Sweetest Thing. So the band entered the studio for a couple of days to rewrite, remix, and re-record the thing. The Edge added a couple of extra chords, and Bono changed the vocals a bit. And the results were pretty good. The song was released as a single from this Greatest Hits collection, and it did all right on the charts. There was a video and everything. It shows Bono and his wife in a horse-drawn carriage tooling around St. Stephen's Green in Dublin. And the video also features members of a band called Boyzone, who were there at Ali's request. Bono threw in the Chippendale dancers as a bit of a bonus. So have a listen to this song. This is not the one from 1998. This is the original B-side from 1986. It's the sweetest thing.
U2's best B-side, the original version of The Sweetest Thing. By the way, Bono and the band gave that song to Allie. All royalties generated by it now go directly to the Chernobyl Children's Project. This is a group that helps children affected by the Chernobyl disaster of 1986. The money pays to get kids out of the contaminated zone for a while. There are those who say that Oasis made a grave mistake with their song Acquiesce. The mistake was making it a B-side instead of making sure that it was released as an official single. Some Oasis fans consider this to be the song that got away. In fact, one British magazine rated Acquiesce the second greatest Oasis song of all time, ahead of Supersonic, ahead of Champagne Supernova, and ahead of even Wonderwall. Only Live Forever was better. So say the critics. No one has ever adequately explained why Acquiesce ended up tucked at the end of the Some Might Say EP, which came out on April 24, 1995. Considering what had happened to the band the previous months, it would have been perfect. I mean, listen to the words. First of all, we've got a duet, Liam and Noel. Liam, who sounds more than ever like John Lennon, sings his brother's words about how everyone needs to hold it together. Of course, he and Noel had been fighting. In fact, in late 1994, several months before this EP came out, Noel had actually walked out on the band during a tour of the States, providing months of fodder for the tabloids. And now here's the two of them singing this duet with words like, we need each other, we believe in each other. Had this been a proper single at the time, it would have been huge. You never heard it? Okay, here it is. The greatest of all Oasis B-sides from the spring of 1995. This is Acquiesce. Oasis with Acquiesce, a B-side from the Some Might Say EP, and the lead track on a collection called The Master Plan. Hardcore fans maintain that you can't understand Oasis completely if you don't get into their B-sides. And they've got a point, because since they've been around, Oasis has released over three albums worth of songs that have never appeared on any album. And many of these tracks are as strong or stronger than the band's A-sides. If you want to explore this area of the Oasis catalog, look for that 1998 collection of B-sides called The Master Plan. You will be very, very pleased. Like Oasis, and unlike so many other groups, Radiohead is a band who pays as much attention to their B-sides as they do to their A-sides. And even though Radiohead has a reputation of taking too long between albums, many fans are overlooking three CDs worth of stuff from the group's EPs. And like Oasis fans, people into Radiohead will tell you that you're not getting the full effect unless you explore the B-sides. One of the best is this track from 1996. Although it sounds much better live than it does in the studio, fans single out Talk Show Host from 1996 as one of Radiohead's greatest non-album offerings. It first appeared on the Street Spirit single. Street Spirit first appeared on The Bends, and in England and the Netherlands and Australia, Street Spirit was released as a single back on January 22, 1996. Canadian fans could get this single, but only as an import. It's worth the hunt. Here it is, Radiohead and the Street Spirit B-side known as Talk Show Host. I want to I want to be someone else so I'll explode Radiohead with their original version of their great B-side talk show host. And don't be fooled by the remix of the Romeo and Juliet soundtrack. Go for the original from 1996. We have time for one more, and this B-side comes from the Pixies. Like all the great bands we've talked about on this show, the Pixies were able to generate more material than they needed to fill their quota of albums. Black Francis often had songs coming out the yin-yang, which was okay because they provided some value-added bonuses to the singles and EPs the band was obligated to release. One of the great Pixies singles was Wave of Mutilation, which appeared on the Pixies' brilliant Doolittle album from 1989. And it was, it was typical Pixies, you know, loud, fast, screamy. But there was another version of the song. It was slower, more carefully paced, and almost languid. They called it the UK Surf Mix. But 
That's a bit of a misnomer because it's not a remix. It's a completely different recording. It first appeared on a one-sided 12-inch promotional record, which is very rare, only 800 were pressed up. Then it showed up buried at the back of the Here Comes Your Man single, and from there it was shuffled to the soundtrack of a movie starring Kristen Slater called Pump Up the Volume. Depending on your view of the Pixies, you may consider this to be the superior version of Wave of Mutilation. See what you think. The Pixies, with the UK surf version of Wave of Mutilation. If you'd like to explore more of this hidden side of the Pixies, there's a CD called The Complete B-Sides, which was released in March of 2001. And there you have it, nine of the greatest B-Sides in the history of alt-rock. Obviously, there are more than nine, but this show is only an hour long. And if we had more time, I would have probably included a New Order song called 1963. And then there's the Chili Peppers' Show Me Your Soul. And sometime in the future, we're going to have to take the next step, the next logical step, which is to feature the greatest non-album tracks of all time, songs that didn't appear on an album or as a B-side or on an EP. And for that, we'd have to look on soundtracks and tribute albums and benefit records. And you know what? There's a lot of that stuff out there, too. Thanks for hanging out. And remember, you can always email me with any questions or critiques about this show. Just fire something to alan at edge.ca. I do my best to answer every single message I get, and I'm actually pretty obsessive about it. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. See you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 